Hello everyone, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 233. This week, the questions are taken from the guides 276 and 277, that's the guides to the Ironclad Gangut, not the Dreadnought, and USS Houston CA-30, along with the Wednesday videos on the loss of 4 said, and one of the interviews that I did with, uh, with an Italian historian on the Regia Marina specifically looking at their early history and their naval guns, with a guest question from a Friday video on the Victory at Sea war game system. Brendan Boersdorf asks, How would you go about modernising an ironclad? The conversion of the Ottoman ironclad Mesodaya seems like a good starting point, but how could you modernise even further? Well, a lot of it depends on what kind of ironclad you're modernising. Because, of course, you have broadside battery ironclads like Warrior. You have central battery ironclads like HOS Hercules, as you can see here in her original form. And you have turreted ironclads in various forms. So you've got uh, Dreadnought, Thunderer, and Devastation, which are also mastless. But you also have turreted, masted ironclads like Monarch. And you also have Barbette ironclads of various descriptions, both masted and not. Now, with Hercules, that she's a good example because, as you can see, she's a fairly classic sail and steam central battery ironclad. And then here she is modernised. So, all of a sudden, she looks vaguely more like a pre-dreadnought. But, of course, a close inspection will reveal that she doesn't have any barbette or turreted guns on the centre line. She's still reliant on that central battery, although the guns have been somewhat updated. And so, to modernise an ironclad... One, it depends on how much money you're willing to spend, and two, it depends on, as I said earlier, what kind of ironclad you've got. Personally, I actually think the masted ones would probably be better to convert, because generally speaking, the masted ones have a higher freeboard, which is a good place to start, and also, obviously, removing all the sails masts, rigging, etc. saves a huge amount of top weight, which gives you a lot of leeway for further modernisation. The problem with modernising the mastless ones, like the Trafalgar class, Sans Barai, or if you go back further to Devastation, etc., is they tend to be very, very low freeboard. And as a result, you're going to have problems in fully modernising them, because either you're going to have a very low freeboard ship still, which will impose certain restrictions on what else you can upgrade, or if you lighten the ship significantly, although that might give you more freeboard, it's probably going to throw out your stability and balance quite a lot, because the ships were not designed to be high freeboard in the first place. In theory, I suppose you could build them up, but at that point you're effectively building a brand new ship. Then you've got to consider, as I said, what how much you're willing to spend. So, if you're modernising an ironclad, replacing the machinery is definitely the first place to get to go. If you're you know, trying to modernise an ironclad for 20th century service, even if it's only 1900s, 1910s, the advances in machinery, both in terms of power output and size, compactness, are massive. So replace the engines. The guns obviously also are going to have to be replaced. And this is where you may have issues because, of course, central battery ironclads, they might carry some fairly hefty guns, but they're probably going to be short barrel ones, whereas you're going to end up with longer barrel ones with considerably more recoil by the 1900s, and they may not be suitable for broadside battery firing. So by that inference, a turreted masted ironclad would probably be the best one to select because then obviously you can just replace the turrets and you have everything on the center line and you're relatively good to go. So something like Ajax here might be a good place to start, the kind of the central citadel turreted, originally masted ironclads, although this is her in a later iteration. Now, if you're replacing the guns in the turrets with longer barrel ones, um, probably thinning the turret armor down at the same time, because of course as an ironclad, they would have had very, very thick armour, and you can get the same level of protection with less using Harvey Steel. So you've addressed the firepower, you've addressed the uh, the propulsion, and therefore potentially increased the speed somewhat. And then your other choice is what you're going to do about the armour. Now, if you want to save a lot of weight, and again, potentially, to a certain degree, 
um, improve the freeboard, you might be um, decreasing it again by installing newer quick firing weapons and so forth as well, or a lot of machinery if you want it to go faster. This is going to be, again, quite expensive, but possible to do because these ironclads are either going to be using iron or compound armor, whereas if you're refitting them with Harvey or Krupp steel, again, you know, same protection or better protection for less weight by installing steel plates. So I think overall it's not really that worth it because at the end of the day you're going to get a relatively small pre-dreadnought equivalent with worse arcs of fire and essentially non-existent underwater protection for the most part unless you put massive amounts of bulging on it which will slow it back down again and it's going to cost an absolute fortune to do but if you absolutely have to then the mastered turret ships are probably your best bet to go for as a starting point. Bounty Flamore asks were there any advantages of the paddle wheel compared to screw propulsion? There were a few, um, albeit that some of them came with their own offsets. So here you can see HMS Salamander modelling a later model paddle wheel propulsion set. So, advantages of the paddle wheel. The piercing in the hull, where the, the shaft had to emerge, was above the water, as opposed to with a screw propeller where it has to be below the water. So that's slightly less vulnerable to, say, mine shock or something, which was a thing in the the last part of the 19th century, thanks to the use of mines in the Crimean War. And, you know, other things that might twist or warp the hull. Uh, you can't have water flooding up a propeller shaft with a paddle wheel vessel because the shaft is above the water. Um, another thing, the paddle ships were a bit more agile at low speed because, of course, well, as long as you've got paddle wheels that can be run in alternate directions which wasn't necessarily the case on all paddle ships but if you do then obviously you have a ship that can spin itself 180 degrees in place which is quite handy and they retain more of their ability to control their direction of travel at lower speeds as compared to a screw vessel so a paddle ship in a pinch can basically moor itself or dock itself um, wouldn't be particularly wise but you could do it whereas a screw ship coming in on its own, uh, certainly in those days, could have some issues retaining control enough to dock up, hence tugs and so forth. Um, the other thing is that the machinery run doesn't extend from basically amidships where the boilers are all the way aft. So on a screw ship, if you get a penetrating hit, usually below the waterline along that entire length, some part of your machinery could be broken which cripples your means of propulsion. With a paddle wheel ship, everything is near enough concentrated amidships, which means that as a unit of length, your machinery is less likely to take a hit. The flip side to that is that the machinery is partially exposed above the waterline, and therefore, if a ship takes general hits, it's more likely to get damaged. Whereas with screw propulsion, there was a concerted effort to keep everything below the waterline, where at least in the 19th century, penetrating hits were somewhat less likely except at extreme close range. William Goyne asks, I see lots of portholes on USS Houston, some down relatively close to the waterline. More modern warships are nearly devoid of portholes. What triggered this change in design? Was it the availability of air conditioning or something else? It's true a lot of World War One and World War Two era warships, you can see Houston and Augusta here, do have a huge number of portholes or scuttles and yeah, when you look at modern warships, they tend not to. Now, partly, yes, this is a function of having air conditioning, because portholes being open was a very easy way to air con well air condition a ship, I should say, maybe keep the air in the lower portions of a ship habitable, um, at least when, obviously, waves aren't washing up over them. So there's that. But also, obviously, when they're not being shuttered off for action, they also allow light in, which is, again, quite useful. So whilst, yes, to a certain extent, the advent of air conditioning and electric lighting in post-World -war, post War II shipping 
mitigates against them and therefore they are can be eliminated makes things much easier eliminates weaknesses in the hull the problem is not so much the electric lighting and the um, air conditioning per se because both of those things exist to a certain degree already you know electric lighting on the ship is already a thing um for quite a while be it before world one and world war two and air conditioning well climate control as a whole um etc again that exists in some way shape or form already um due to you know forced draft in the boiler rooms um keeping the magazine t to a certain temperature and humidity regimen etc the restrictions on applying that across the ship are more to do with the size of the machinery in question so obviously as technology improves you can do uh, the same kind of thing but with smaller equipment that so that helps um, to in allow these things to be incorporated more into the more general portions of the ship but you also have the issue of power generation now one of the things you'll see, especially during World War II, as more, there's more and more electrical demand placed on the ships, is additional generators often being slotted in during refits. By the time you get to the Cold War, then electrical power generation on the ships is being emphasised more and more. And that, as much as anything else, is what allows you to integrate these other systems lighting air conditioning etc across the board rather than relying on the more manual stuff plus i suppose there was probably some concern about nbc proofing it's a lot easier to nbc proof a hull when all you have to worry about is hatches um, as opposed to all of these portholes airplane master one asks assuming for a moment that either the 40 millimeter bofors or the 20 millimeter orlikan failed as an anti-aircraft gun too complex poor performance than in our timeline or just random faults that make it lose a competition if so what would have been the replacement or supplement to it for example if the 20 millimeter failed would the 1.1 inch chicago piano be kept as light aa with the 40 millimeter bofors staying on as heavy aa etc for the 40 millimeter bofors it's actually fairly easy to tell what would have replaced it because in both the 20mm and 40mm cases, uh, the US actually held competitions to determine which gun they should adopt. Obviously, the Orlikan and the Bofors being the winners in their respective categories. But in the 40mm category, the what I would term medium anti-aircraft weapon, Bjord was also very impressed with the British 40mm pom-pom in its single, double, quadruple and octuple forms. And the Bofors, although it beat the pom-pom in the US evaluation, it wasn't by a colossally huge margin. So if the 40mm Bofors had failed for whatever reason, I think with probably a few adaptations here and there, the US would have been pretty happy just adopting the 40mm the pom-pom, and things would have gone on from there. With the 20mm Orlikan, it's a lot more difficult, because the Chicago Piano, the 1.1 inch, 28mm, it was still being very finicky. Yes, they were working out the issues, but it was never going to be the world's best weapon, um, certainly compared to others. But they did have it at the time. Now, you might think, well, what was the competition for the Orlikan 20mm? Wouldn't they have just gone for that? Well, the competition was the Hispano Suiza 20mm, which the Army and, by extension, the Army Air Force actually were relatively in favour of because they already had the Hispanos had fitted to some of their aircraft, and so did the British. Whereas by adopting the Orlikan, you were adopting another type of 20mm weapon. However, when you look at the Bjord evaluation of the Orlikan versus the Hispano, the Hispano 20mm cannon had a lot of issues. Um, it was by far and away the Orlikan's entry that won that 1940 evaluation. So... If the Orlikan had failed, I don't think anyone would have been particularly falling over themselves to adopt the Hispano anytime soon. Now, granted, the 1934 version of the Orlikan had also failed competitions because of a number of issues. So, and obviously Orlikan had revised that and gotten a pretty war-winning weapon into the people's hands just before the start of World War II. 
So that's not necessarily to say that the issues with the Hispano couldn't have been overcome, um, but it probably would have taken quite some time. So I suspect that if the Orlican had failed, then they would have carried on with uh, the 1.1 inch and, well, maybe quad machine guns, but I really doubt that. Probably just seen more and more 40 mils, either Bofors or pom-poms, depending on who, which side you're talking about, which fleet you're talking about, whilst they either got Orlikan to go back and try again, or they started the long and laborious process of trying to fix the Hispanos. Reva asks, An unexpected detail was the ironclad gangut carrying four landing guns. I know the age of sail in the age of sail a ship might carry a couple of carriages amongst the ballast cargo to dismount guns for land work if needed, but I hadn't heard of non-landing craft style ships continuing to carry land capable guns from the ironclad eras and upwards. Was this more common than I thought and when or where did the practice end? So I covered this to a degree in the Patreon dry dock just gone, um, but essentially yes, pretty much all large vessels, whether they be capital ships or some of the bigger cruisers and even some of the smaller cruisers to a certain extent, throughout the ironclad era and even into the age of pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts would carry at least some landing guns with them and this goes even as far as the king george v um, in the 1930s they had i believe if i remember offhand one uh, landing gun that was just you know purely a land-based artillery piece nothing to do with what was on the ship and that's in addition to any carriages that they might have to dismount guns that were ostensibly part of the ship's battery and carriages they might improvise to dismount guns that were part of the ship's battery which a lot of naval captains would end up doing in some of the more prolonged campaigns now as for why it's basically for the same reasons i explained in the patreon dry dock uh, back in the day before large-scale airlifts and certainly in a period when you either didn't want to pay for a garrison all over the world or it was a uh, theoretically independent country and obviously they're not going to let you garrison in their country well a warship showing up with several hundred men or a fleet showing up with several thousand men was often the fastest and only form of reaction you could get to an international situation for quite some time weeks if not months at which point well you might as well do something about it then and to try and sort the problem sooner rather than let it escalate and need a much more expensive solution later that may or may not actually solve the problem. The practice appears to have died out at some point during the Second World War, which I presume roughly correlates with the availability of air power, not just in terms of taking the offensive to the enemy, but also in terms of being able to transport people closer to the front lines where they might be needed. Christopher Babylon asks, in relation to USS Oriskany being turned into a man-made reef, do you think it's more cost-effective to scrap old ships or to turn them into reefs, and what are the pros and cons? Theoretically, in just terms of pure hard cash, it's more cost-effective to scrap a ship, because, in theory at least, the Navy gets paid for that um, by the scrapyard. It might not be a huge amount, and it's certainly not going to be a scratch on how much the ship costs to build and maintain during its service life, but it's something. So the end-of-life procedure for the ship, if you like, is a small cost positive for the Navy. Whereas if you are going to sink the ship and turn it into a reef, well, it might sound easy, but as it turns out, well, ships, especially old ships, tend to have all sorts of wonderfully toxic substances aboard them, and various environmental regulations and protection agencies tend to take a dim view of effectively putting a small chemical spill disaster down into the ocean when its ostensible purpose is to help. So, whereas if you send that ship for scrapping, one, that's the scrapyard's problem, and two, some of those contaminants can be removed in a stage-by-stage -stage process as the ship is broken up and the contaminants are revealed. Whereas if you're going to deep six the ship, then you have to go through the ship while it's still mostly intact and either remove or isolate a good chunk of the pollutants or make an agreement with the environmental regulation agency in question that this thing may theoretically be toxic, but probably isn't going to be a huge problem uh, 
even though on paper it looks like it might be. Uh, for example, some of the insulation, both in wires and generally used within ships back in the day, was pretty toxic if you happen to eat it. But on the same, you know, the same boat, it's literally, um, <laughs> it's not likely to end up in the water in any great amount because it's usually fairly solid or very contained. And, well, fish and stuff are not generally known for trying to chew on electrical wires for the most part. So once you've gone through the expense of all that, you then also have to go through the issues of finding a place and then setting up the demolition charges and organising the sinking, etc. So turning a wreck into a reef for the organisation that originally owns the ship is considerably more expensive than just scrapping her. But it does mean that you are actually giving something back to a seaborne environment, which, to be fair, humans have made something of a mess of over the last few hundred years. So if it can be afforded, and even with all those additional costs, it's still, compared to the cost of building and running the ship overall, it's not a massive cost, I would personally encourage more old ships to be turned into reefs rather than just broken up in random scrapyards uh, a lot of the time in third world countries where, well, let's just say the protections for the workers breaking them up and exposure to aforementioned toxic elements are probably not that great. Plus, of course, if you sink it in the right place and you make it a nice habitat for marine life, you also potentially get a second life in terms of revenue out of it because you can, it can become, well, it will become a diving site for scuba divers and rec other recreational divers, at which point you, I mean, the Navy itself probably can't organise it, but for the, in terms of the local economy, uh, that might provide a bit of a boost there. Shadow asks, how is a ship's speed measured? I assume it's calculated with a combination of machinery, RPM, time and distance, but I've heard of ships being designed for 22 knots and actually making 23 and a half, for instance. As I'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between 75 to 100 kilometers an hour in my car without a speedometer, how is such a precise measurement arrived at at sea in, say, a 30,000 ton battleship? So first, there'll be calculated values. So of course, you know there have, will have been model tests and various calculations to work out the whole form, its resistance, etc., etc. They know how much power they're putting into the ship via the ship's boilers, and they can run that with the propellers, etc., etc., and work out, okay, at X amount of power, this ship should do Y amount of speed. But of course, that's a calculation. You may get it spot on, you may get it horrifically wrong, you may get it right in some places and not in others. And that's what the speed trials are for. Well, they also use speed trials to work out exactly how fast the ship can go, but nonetheless, the idea of speed trials is you have a measured mile and the ship will get up to a specific rate of RPM, specific power output, and will run that measured mile. So it will you know, accelerate up to, let's say, if they think the ship's capable of 30 knots, they'll accelerate up to what their calculations say are 30 knots, before they hit the first point of the mile and then they'll keep the engines at that setting through the mile and of course the time that they pass the first marker and the time they pass the second marker will be known and then using you know, simple mathematics you can calculate well it took x amount of time to travel one mile therefore calculate that through into hours which will give you nautical miles per hour which is knots and that'll tell you how fast you were actually going now of course wind and tide currents etc that can all throw the results off a little bit so you don't just do one you do several runs going back and forth and that will give you an average and that'll tell you you know at x power output this is actually what the speed of the ship is and you can also obviously then just max it out and find out what your top speed is by doing the same thing. And if any of those values are significantly in variance to what the calculated values are, then you would adjust the dials, etc. within your ship to reflect that. So if, for example, you thought you would be able to do 29 knots at 200 RPM, and it turns out that you actually need to do 210 RPM to hit 29 knots, well, then that's a fairly easy change to make, or the other way around if you want. So 
that is how you work out exactly what a ship speed is and then of course once you know that you can then sail off into the horizon and your future readings on your instruments whether saying okay we're going at this many knots will be calculated based off of those now known fixed values reading off of your propeller shafts rpm which of course means that your absolute apparent speed at any given time may not actually necessarily reflect what your instruments are showing um, if there's particularly strong currents going on or if you are in a major storm uh, for instance then your instruments may show that you're going at a certain speed but you in terms of point to point speed you may not be uh, an easy example would be in a big storm if you talk about really mountainous waves, if you're having to go up the wave over and down, up the wave over and down, you are traveling a considerably longer distance than you would be if you were traveling on a flat calm sea, at which point if you were, say you thought you were going at 28 knots, you might actually be going at an average speed of 28 knots overall. Obviously you'd be slowing down going up the wave and speeding up going back down the other side. But because you're traveling a longer distance, your speed of advance through the water might be 28 knots. But if someone measured you over a measured mile, your apparent overall speed might actually be somewhat less. Verek asks, here's a more political force said question. In his autobiographical history of the World War II, Churchill insists he would have cancelled the mission if he had known there was no carrier going along with the two battleships. Is this post facto political backside covering, or was Winston just caught off guard by the actual deployments made by his fleet? I think it's very, very much a case of political backside covering, because there is no way that Churchill didn't know what Forsyth was made up of. I mean, he'd been the one to, in part, to insist on Forsyth being deployed in the first place, and... As a result, there were multiple plans, as I covered in the Forsyth video, drawn up as to what they could send. Then resources intervened and it dictated that in the end, Prince of Wales and Repulse was what was available. Now, it's true that Churchill did mention an aircraft carrier with Forsyth would be a good idea a couple of months before the actual incident. But he was also aware of the Admiralty basically saying, well, there isn't one available and this was repeatedly emphasised during various meetings that were held all through the time period in the run-up to the loss of Forsyth. The only aircraft carrier that was in the Indian Ocean at all was Hermes, which, amongst various other things, was far too slow to operate with Repulse and Prince of Wales. And ultimately, as I covered in the video on Forsyth, there wasn't any particular reason at that point to think that they needed a carrier in December 1941. In hindsight, it's very easy to, and obvious to say, yes, they did need one. But again, as mentioned at the time, every bit of intelligence they had to hand seemed to show that the Japanese bombers, even if they could use torpedoes, wouldn't be able to reach the area that Forsyth was operating in because it was thought that their torpedo carrying range was much shorter from the air bases that they might have moved into and as it turned out had moved into um, so that they wouldn't be able to reach the British ships and I know a few people in the comments at that point said well you know Japanese bombers had shown up over Singapore so that should have been an indication that they had longer range than expected not really actually because when you look at any bomber that was used in both a bomb carrying and a torpedo carrying role whether that be a swordfish a Beaufort a Wellington an Italian SM-79 or a German Heinkel 111 torpedoes are pretty hefty things um they they are they have a lot of weight certainly compared to a bomber that might only be carrying a few 250 pound bombs and also they impose a lot of drag because on most aircraft uh, it's not some of the larger multi-engine ones perhaps not but on certainly on a lot of twin-engined and almost all the single-engine aircraft the torpedoes have to be carried outside so there's a lot of drag involved as well as weight and therefore it was known by pretty much everybody that yeah you could get an aircraft to carry a light bomb payload internally 
a lot further than you could get the same aircraft to carry a torpedo payload externally. And thus they made the, the judgment, which turned out to be wrong, because it turned out the Japanese uh, bombers could carry torpedoes a lot further than they thought. But there was logic behind that reasoning. So if you put yourself in the place of either the Royal Navy or Winston Churchill in December 1941, Churchill's statement doesn't really make sense, because why would you need to insist on a carrier to go with a force that every bit of intel at the time is telling you can't be attacked by aircraft capable of hurting them. That doesn't make any sense. Um, in hindsight, when you know the Japanese aircraft are capable of hurting them, then of course you need a carrier, but that's very handy for writing post-war histories. True Khmer asks, You mentioned in 1943 the Italian battle fleet was ready to sail out and meet the Allies in open seas to destroy or at least to disrupt the supply lines and possibly even bombard Allied positions on the coast. If the armistice was not signed before the two fleets started battling, what could have happened in your view? Would it have been complete destruction of the Italian battle line or a successful disruption of the supply lines or something in between? So it's an interesting one to consider. However, there are a few factors that you have to establish beforehand. Firstly, what was available total to the Italian fleet versus what the Italian fleet actually was preparing to sail, because the Italian fleet was critically short of fuel. In theory, in various states of repair, you had Littorio, uh, although at that point she'd been renamed Italia, Vittorio Veneto and Roma, so you had three modern battleships, um, a couple of them sporting a few bomb bruises, but nothing that's going to critically affect their operation plus Andrea Doria and Duilio. Giulio Cesare and Conte di Cavour probably aren't going to be available. Cesare is being used as a training vessel, and Cavour is still under repairs after Taranto. So, theoretically, five battleships. There's a few heavy cruisers still around, plus light cruisers and destroyers. That's what they have on paper. From what I've been able to find, the force they were actually assembling to go in and attack, however, appears to have been six light cruisers, some escorting smaller craft, and the three Littorios. So the older two, um, the Duilio and Doria, seem to have been left behind, as were the heavy cruisers. Now, if we go with that force, the one the Italians were actually planning on using, it doesn't look particularly brilliant for them, because their attack is coming in against the forces of Operation Avalanche, Avalanche itself, along with Husky, are actually, surprisingly to some people, escorted almost entirely by the Royal Navy when it comes to the big hitters. So the covering forces, you've got HMS King George V and HMS Howe. Anson is up north playing uh, distraction games. You've also got Nelson, Rodney, Warspite and Valiant. So theoretically the Italians have one more modern battleship than the Allied covering force does, but they are actually outnumbered two to one in total. So, you know, three Littorios versus two King George V's, two Nelsons, and two modernised Queen Elizabeths. That would be a very interesting fight. I don't think the Italians are really going to be walking away from that anytime soon, but that especially because there's also considerable carrier support. You have Illustrious and Formidable. They're both present, carrying a about 40 to 50 aircraft apiece, including a fair number of torpedo bombers. They've also got Unicorn, which is operating as a form of carrier, plus there's four escort carriers which can put aircraft into the air. So, realistically speaking, not counting, of course, any land-based air, air cover, and there's more than enough British and American cruisers, destroyers, torpedo boats, etc., MTBs, to overwhelm the Italian lighter forces. So realistically, I think what's going to happen is if the Italians do sail, they're first going to be met with several waves of airborne attack from both Allied land-based aircraft and from the carrier-based aircraft. And then what manages to make it through that is going to be faced with, in the case of the battleships, roughly two to one odds, and in the case of the cruisers and destroyers, significantly more than two to one odds. And, I, well, it is going to cause a significant amount of disruption to the landings, because the Allies aren't stupid. The landing forces, supply ships, etc., will have to make a withdrawal, just in case. Um, 
if they're being smart, the Axis forces might also send out an air attack at the same time. But I don't think the Italian Navy is going to be able to significantly break into the landing area. They will put up one hell of a fight, but they will probably die gloriously under the guns of the US and Royal Navies. Smiley148784 asks, What are the advantages and disadvantages of the whaleback design? So, as modelled ra rather handily here by HMS Hasty, the whaleback design involves essentially plating over the bow of your ship as far back as the bridge, and in this case also the forward gun mount, with this kind of curved top, which looks a little bit like a surfacing whale, hence the name whaleback. Now, this was implemented on a lot of early torpedo boats and destroyers in order to improve sea keeping. And fundamentally, you can probably see from the scale of the chap who's just to so the right of the gun there, these are not large ships. You know, their freeboard, even with an upturned bow, is really, really low. And I've got a couple of other pictures elsewhere of these ships trying to forge their way through the seas, and you can then rather see the problem. In fact, I'll put one up now. And as you can tell, this is not a particularly large swell, um, but with such low freeboard, even the slightest amount of pitch or a ship's wake or whatever, and suddenly there's a lot of water coming over the front. Now, if you had a ship to a more conventional bow profile, this would be a major problem because you'd have water sitting on your forecastle, potentially draining into your ship via hatches and so forth, none of which is particularly good. And so what the whaleback design theoretically allows for is, because it's a sealed unit, the water then should just roll off. It's curved, so it shouldn't sit on there. And because of, again, the curve, the water, in theory at least, splits left and right somewhat. Now, um, how much that worked in practice and how much it just dumped water into the bridge it depended on the exact ship. You can see actually here, again, there's a rather enterprising chap who's up on the bridge, um, just poking his head up there above the, the spray. And you can actually just about tell that in this case, the whaleback is kind of doing its job. There's two big plumes of water, but they are going either side of the bridge rather than straight at it, which I suppose is good. So the overall advantage to the whaleback design is it means that you can get these very small craft up to fairly high speeds without risking swamping them, which allows you to have a high-speed torpedo boat or small destroyer and you know not lose every fifth one the minute the sea kicks up. The disadvantage is that it means, because you don't have particularly high focusal, you end up getting water over the bows quite a lot, especially at speed. And that amount of water just hitting the surface area of the whaleback is going to weigh the ship down somewhat, push the bow down a little bit, basically make it slow down. So it's, you know, the advantage of not flooding versus the disadvantage of being significantly slowed every time you take water over the bow. Um, and because it is a vaguely hydrodynamic shape it means in much heavier seas if the bow digs in it's somewhat loath to come back up again it actually likes traveling underwater somewhat more than a more conventional bow shape so although it it allows you to operate in high seas but with a significant speed and sea keeping penalty the ultimate solution is of course a much higher focusal but you can only really do that with a larger ship and they were trying to address the issue. So this is TB83. Again, she's got a whaleback design, but as you can see, it's a little bit more ridged. And it also looks like I've got a little uh, lookout, covered lookout dash command post just forward. And as you can see, she's a very small craft. And you can see here with TB33, this is a somewhat different approach to things, as you can probably tell. Although she doesn't have the pronounced whaleback of some of her slightly larger cousins, She's effectively, in a lot of ways, forward, almost resembling more of a submarine than a surface vessel. So this is more of a graduated continuation of the whaleback. And Atlas asks, Any thoughts on the addition of combined arms and the practicality of combining multiple tabletop games? As stated, this from the Warlord Games video, uh, combined arms is intended to allow players to incorporate bolt action, blood red skies, cruel seas, 
or Victory at Sea for an epic continent-spanning wargame campaign. I think if you've got the wargaming group or the ridiculous amount of finances that allow you to actually implement something like that, then it's definitely worth a shot um, with combined arms rules. Because historically speaking, trying to fit air, sea and land all into one game system, it can be done to a certain extent. Um, the old dystopian wars had air and sea operating together and you could incorporate armoured clash as well. But with Warlord games, obviously they do these various um, game systems. And I think if you were planning an overall campaign between a large wargaming group, that would be a good way of incorporating people who collect different game systems into one overall narrative. Because, for example, you could do a fairly, you know, look, since we've been talking about Husky and Avalanche, you could do a system where part of the campaign was a fleet that is trying to destroy an enemy formation so that it can enable the landings to take place. And then the overall, in this case, Victory at Sea campaign would be can we get the landings to take place in the first place? And if so, how successfully? And then what is the enemy fleet going to do to try and uh, counter that? So there'd be a whole series of full-scale naval battles going on. You could then move into a Cruel Seas, which is much smaller scale, um, campaign where you're looking at enemy coastal forces and their attempts to disrupt the landings uh, or to attack supply convoys and so forth. And then you would go into bolt action with the landings themselves, people fighting back and forth on land. And if someone wants to say, well, in the next bolt action um, camp uh, battle, I want to bring in some hefty air support on either side. Or if you, you know, in the naval battles, you want to bring in either an air attack in the cruel seas section or a major land based air attack on somebody's navy in victory at sea, you can be fighting that out in the Blood Red Skies battles, you know, to determine, okay, well, there's a bunch of air combats going on. Who wins that? Well, that gives options for the other combat systems to bring more or fewer aircraft into their battles. So I think, yeah, if you do it correctly with the right number of people, it's a very good idea and obviously very useful when a single company with a single approximate rule set publishes a whole bunch of different games. Alec Ruby asks... In the Alaska, insert various superlative titles, cruiser video, you stated that the Alaskas were a self-fulfilling prophecy. What other ships would you say fit the bill of a self-fulfilling prophecy? I think in terms of a self-fulfilling prophecy, i.e. a ship that is designed to meet a specific need, but in existing it creates that class of ship beyond its initial build. And I know that sounds a little bit clumsy, but... I guess the short version of that would be a ship that brings the other ships that are competitors to it into existence simply by existing, rather than being, you know, just an odd one off or something. Broadly, I think pretty much any of what you might call the escalator ships, or at least I might call them that. Um, and by an escalator ship, I mean a ship that is a significant step change compared to everything that's gone before it. And usually that kind of vessel ends up provoking everything shifting over to that paradigm, even though the initial attempt at building that vessel may actually have been aimed more at stamping one's authority on things. Because essentially, you know, if you've got an iterative escalation, so you have the heavy cruisers in the interwar period, the armoured cruisers in the pre-World War One period, um, and so on and so forth, then... No, none of those ships particularly stand out compared to some of the ships we're about to discuss because they sit there and you know, they're a little bit better than the previous ones, but they're not quite as good as the ones that come the next year, so they all sit comfortably within a range. But then you have, I guess, what today would be called disruptor ships, a ship that completely changes the paradigm. So you have things like HMS Warrior potentially but to a lesser extent hms devastation definitely hms dreadnought alaska and so forth and when they are introduced everyone has one of two alternatives in the terms of naval competition either adapt or die 
So you can either go, okay, right, well, you know, everything has changed. And we can either accept that whoever has introduced this change is now the dominant power, or we can not accept that. But if we choose not to accept that and we don't want to surrender our national sovereignty, we have to build something as good or better. And thus, you know, Warrior was a reasonable attempt, reasonably good attempt, actually, at answering Gloire and going, no, France, you can't keep maintain parity with us, even with fancy technological tricks, we're better than you. And, you know, when you look at Warrior and her successors, not necessarily including things like the defense class, but, you know, the full-size ironclads, it did take a while for France to catch up. Now, they built a lot of Gloire successors immediately thereafter, which you know, weren't as good as Warrior. But eventually they did, and it prompted everybody else to go, OK, Ironclads are the now the new thing. We'll have some of those as well, especially since British Yards were obviously very happy to sell the latest and greatest Ironclad designs to all and sundry. And so Warrior went from being a game changer to the start of you know, this self-fulfilling prophecy that now everything is moving over to Ironclads. And the same with Dreadnought. Yeah, Dreadnought, significantly more powerful than pre-Dreadnoughts, meant to stamp Britain's authority on the world, albeit it was also partly a case of Admiral Fisher seeing which way the wind was going. But um, whilst a few nations were a little bit slower on the uptake than others, everyone kind of looked at it and went, we could give Britain completely untrammeled dominion over all of the seas and not bother to challenge them again in the future. Or we could build dreadnoughts of our own. And guess what? Everyone chose to do that as well. And then the same thing when you get to Alaska. Alaska is, in many ways, the ultimate cruiser killer. And, you know, if in a world of 10,000 ton-ish treaty cruisers armed with 8-inch guns, she's absolutely fantastic. And then the Japanese got word of her and went, right, we need to modify our B-65 designs. And the Russians got word of her and went, right, we need some as well. And so on and so forth and thus an entire new class was born cisco fan asks was the british siege of fort mchenry in the war of 1812 and the subsequent plan for the invasion of baltimore a good idea why did the fort not fall and if it had fallen would the city have also fallen do you think in terms of grand strategy it was actually a pretty good idea to try and take baltimore one of the things that perhaps people don't usually realize about the war of 1812 is that by the time it was it came to an end in 1815 the u.s forces were actually on something of the back foot um obviously people in the states celebrate the uh, repulse of the british attack on new orleans ironically enough after the treaty was signed but thanks to communications no one actually knew the war was over at that point but you know never mind but what the the more popular histories of the War of 1812 tend to gloss over is the fact that the British had taken and held territory in two U.S. states, um, technically three, if you look at the modern borders. Uh, but basically, they had occupied significant portions of the Georgia coast. They'd occupied a good chunk of Maine. They'd also taken, um, in conjunction with local allies, a bunch of territory that wasn't officially part of the US at this point, but would later become, very shortly after the war, Illinois, and much later Wisconsin. But it was territory that the US really, really wanted for itself. The various lake battles were a little bit of a mixed bag, admittedly, but you had HMS St. Lawrence ensuring dominance over the area around the major cities that are concentrated on the Great Lakes, at least for as long as that lasted, bearing in mind both the Americans and the British were building another couple of ships of the line each, first rates that is. And of course there's the ongoing operations in Louisiana, and again it should be noted that while the attack on New Orleans failed, the British response was to gather everyone up and they were going to go after Mobile instead, which they probably would have taken, except for the fact that the uh, Treaty of Ghent came over via as news, and so they had to you know, not do that. But when you look at the overall British war aims of the period, they basically seemed to be taking an approach of cutting out and occupying significant coastal regions of the United States, and bits of that weren't officially the United States yet, but the United States claimed. 
Um, and when I say coastal, that kind of technically also applies to the Great Lakes region. It seems they actually probably would have wanted to actually keep Louisiana long term. There is a bit of historical dispute about that, but some there's certainly some correspondence that indicates that might be the case. And the other thing that they were doing, especially on the Georgia and Maine coasts, and what they were trying to do elsewhere down the East Coast, which is where Baltimore and Fort McHenry comes in, was to take and occupy these various U.S. port areas. Because if they can do that, then bearing in mind that at this stage of history, the U.S. economy relies quite significantly on trade, well, you can strangle American trade even more than you they had actually done at that point. Um, America ha actually had quite a good thing going prior to the War of 1812 as basically a neutral shipping magnate, bearing in mind most of the rest of the world had taken sides in the Napoleonic Wars. Most of that had been driven into port or destroyed during the War of 1812. The ports were now blockaded. The US Navy was mostly blockaded by the end of the war. And as a result, the US was very quickly running out of money and discovering that its soldiers tended not to fight well, if at all, if you didn't pay them. And with Baltimore being a very major and important port at the time, the British wanted to take that, and Fort McHenry was in the way. As for whether the bombardment plan was a good idea, for what intelligence the British had about Fort McHenry, the forces they committed were perfectly adequate. The problem that they had was that it was only as good as the intelligence, and the intelligence was faulty, because whilst they thought these are the defences that Fort McHenry has in actual fact. Shortly before the actual attack, the Americans had completed additional fortifications that would have required a significantly larger attack force to take it, and hence the attack failed. Now, obviously, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. The Lake Champlain area had not gone well for the British, and that had stymied any thoughts about initially for that period marching on New York. Obviously, the attack on Fort McHenry fell, so they weren't able to take Baltimore, although they had burned Washington a few weeks earlier. And, of course, they hadn't managed to take New Orleans, and the whole thing was incredibly expensive, bearing in mind that this was coming in the brief lull where they thought the Napoleonic Wars were over, but before Napoleon's brief return in 1815. So if Fort McHenry had fallen and the British had been able to launch a combined land and sea operation to attack Baltimore as it stood in 1815... I think it depends how long the war goes on, because you know the Treaty of Ghent negotiations are ongoing whilst all this is happening, but the Americans have kind of put all their eggs into one basket. Baltimore is very heavily defended, so it could potentially last for a while. On the other hand, it's very heavily defended because there's a lot of people there, and if the British are able to prevent resupply by land and resupply by sea, then it's almost a medieval siege-style thing, and starvation would eventually take its toll so Baltimore probably would have fallen eventually as I say because most of the military assets in the area were all concentrated there so there's not exactly going to be a huge amount of relief coming but that assumes that the war would just continue on and on and on whereas in reality most likely what would have happened is Baltimore would have been in a bad way when news of the Treaty of Ghent shows up and then everyone's like, oh okay we're going home now sorry about all that if for some reason, however, Baltimore had fallen before news of the treaty got through or, let's say, the negotiations fail and the war goes on for a bit more, then having possession of Baltimore, which is obviously very close to D.C. and D.C. having been burned, might then give the British A, an operational base for further operations on the central U.S. East Coast, but also would give them another bit of leverage in any subsequent treaty negotiations as to other bits and pieces of territory that they might want, because... If they occupy it, then the Americans have to negotiate to get it back. Ash the Lego Guy asks, The Honda Point disaster was really bad. Even in unadjusted dollars, the loss of otherwise good military equipment and personnel was quite terrible. In known history, what peacetime naval incident within the Channel scope was the contender for the biggest naval disaster caused by a single person or command? I mean, there's a lot of different maritime disasters in peacetime as well as wartime you know everything up to small fleets being lost due to inaccurate navigation um, one of those losses actually prompted the whole longitude race with you know 
clocks and all of that kind of stuff, which I have to cover at some point in the future. However, if you want a peacetime naval incident caused by a single person that had the single biggest effect going forward, you'd struggle to top the loss of the white ship. Um, naval enthusiasts will know what that means, but uh, for those of you who don't, this goes right back. This is the 1100s, so the 12th century. And you have Henry I, of in King of England and Duke of various places, but his only legitimate son and a bunch of his slightly less legitimate children all decide to race home in the white ship and well a combination of youthful exuberance leads them to think ah oh, we can overtake our dad ship and um, beat him back to England which theoretically the white ship being a pretty capable vessel at the time was capable of doing unfortunately the youthful exuberance that caused them to demand the captain do that was largely the result of the fact that they got absolutely hammered uh, before they even left port let alone while they were also under sail and so to the rather lack of surprise of most people who know what happens when you leave someone in charge of a vehicle while they're drink driving um, they managed to drink drive the white ship straight into a rock where it sank and killed everybody aboard um, with the exception of one person who got to watch the whole thing happening from a rock now, wiping out a good chunk of the royal family and various nobility and everything all in one go would be bad enough, except for the fact, as I mentioned, that that was the only legitimate son of Henry I, which then meant that once Henry I died, there was a 20-year period of massive civil war that in English history is known as the Anarchy. It was that bad. Um also noted for the fact that every third person seemed to be named Matilda and everybody wanted to steal each other's Matildas. But that's a bit of a side issue. So yeah, there are a lot of fairly big naval disasters, but very few managed to plunge an entire country into a ruinous civil war for 20 years just because somebody decided to get drunk. Andrenor asks, I know the US Navy names cruisers generally after cities and battleships after states, but how did the US Navy decide the names of the first ships of their class? I don't think there's any particular special selection of this is going to be the name ship of the class, as far as I know. Perhaps someone who's looked a bit more deeply into that can uh, answer in the comments below. But I must admit, looking at least in the interwar period at cruisers, it does seem to be a little bit confusing because you have the Astoria class, which is later renamed to the Norleans class after the loss of Astoria. But Astoria has a higher hull number than New Orleans, but she was laid down first. So you might think, well, okay, in that case, it can't be the hull number that's assigned to the ship that makes it the name ship of the class, because otherwise it would have been the New Orleans class from the outset. But if it, you do it by when ships are laid down well let's review the u.s interwar heavy cruiser classes so you look at the pensacola class okay pensacola is laid down before salt lake city okay that track she's also ca24 as opposed to ca25 but then we go to the northampton class and northampton is ca26 okay so it's the lowest hull number because it goes up to 31 but if you look at the date of hulls being laid down chester is laid down just over a month before northampton but are they the chester class no they're called the Northampton class so that doesn't make a huge amount of sense now it seems like it's the lowest hull number which is the one that gets the name ship of the class and well okay Northampton was the first to be commissioned but that introduces a whole other uh, kettle of fish into the mix um, the Portland class fortunately well fortunately or unfortunately portland is ca33 indianapolis is ca35 portland is laid down before indianapolis just about but then indianapolis is commissioned before portland um so you know the commissioning thing doesn't seem to pan out either then you've got the norleans class which as we mentioned norleans is ca32 astoria is ca34 but astoria is laid down before new orleans and somehow adopts the manages to get the um name ship of the class and commissioning is definitely not a thing because san francisco is actually the first of the new orleans class to be commissioned then you have wichita which is a unique cruiser on its own so it, it gets out scot-free and then finally well technically not into war but might as well wrap up the u.s heavy cruisers you've got the baltimore class and 
thankfully, everything works out reasonably here because Baltimore is CA38, uh, sorry, CA68. It's laid down first and it also commissions first and it has the lowest hull number so everyone can breathe easy with the Baltimores. So it, it seems a little bit odd that there's no consistent pattern. It's definitely not always the lowest hull number, but it's also definitely not always the first to be launched or the first to be laid down, or the first to be commissioned. So it, it does seem a little bit odd, but nonetheless, if somebody can explain it in the comments below, I'm sure we'd all love to know. And finally for this week, Je Trevor Polasek asks, if the American carriers were moored in Pearl Harbor during the attack on December 7th, how vulnerable would they have been? Would the Japanese pilots have prioritized sinking them over the battleships? Absolutely, they would have. Even the December 7th attack plans themselves specifically prioritised the carriers and the aircraft flew in as thinking, well, on approach vectors such that if the carriers were there, they would get first crack at them. In part, that's what, and I know it sounds very odd considering the scale of the disaster at Pearl Harbor, it's part of what actually made the Pearl Harbor attack somewhat less effective than it could have been because a bunch of aircraft coming in were on flight paths that would take them to attack the carriers, which normally, although not all the time, are docked on the far side of Ford Island. In this photo, you can however see that that's not always the case. Admittedly, it is a bit of a long distance photo, but if you look very carefully, you'll actually notice a carrier docked at the end of Battleship Row. So uh, the side that USS Utah was on was normally where the carriers were, but not always, but a bunch of aircraft went over to attack that way which is why U.S. East Utah was sunk, but when they realised there weren't carriers there, they had to swoop around and come in on a little bit of a disjointed approach, which, as I said, made the attack slightly less devastating than it could otherwise have been. In terms of how vulnerable the carriers would have been, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, Lexington or a Lexington class, for example, not exactly particularly advanced in terms of torpedo defense compared to everything else that was at Pearl Harbor, but they do have sheer size going for them, um, I suppose. The Yorktowns are smaller in terms of displacement than uh, pretty much all of the battleships that are present, but they are somewhat more modern, and they do have, therefore, a bit more modern torpedo defense, but again, they have a torpedo defense guide sort of built around a fast carrier not necessarily the massive torpedo defenses you'd see in some of the treaty battleships and they would have been at the same state of readiness as everybody else now whilst carriers are quite tall they don't have the same point loads that battleships do with things like you know the big turrets and so forth but I suppose the main advantage that the carriers probably would have had especially the Yorktowns would have been that they're just not as old and this was a significant problem I mean, one of the reasons Nevada had to beach herself was because there was flooding going all through the ship through various places that hadn't been properly maintained and where holes had been pierced through the bulkheads over time and that was an artifact of just how old a ship she was with the Yorktowns there just hasn't been that same kind of time to happen of course you know, with the Japanese prioritizing hitting them, they almost certainly would have been sunk anyway, regardless of any minor inherent advantages against single hits they would have had. But they would have also been able to be salvaged in a similar way to the battleships. And it's in that kind of water, it's reasonably likely that the carriers probably would have sunk either upright or vaguely upright. There, I mean, there's a chance, of course, they could capsize, but even if they did, in that case, their sheer height might come to the rescue slightly in that even if they do end up go rolling over, they might end up on their side rather than upside down or something like that. So the overall salvage process for the carriers is likely to be somewhat easier because, as I said, you, you can either just refloat them straight up, and significantly more of them is probably going to be out of the water, or if they have rolled, they won't have rolled as far. Of course, if they do somehow contrive to roll over most of the way and crush their flight deck in, they're pretty much write-offs, I think. And that brings us to an end for this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening, everybody, and I hope to see you again in another video set fairly soon. Bye!